Welcome, welcome, welcome. So we are back with another episode of the Adapt Performance Podcast. Um, in today's episode, then, we are covering the topic of blood flow restriction training, so BFR, um, its origins and what it's kind of used for. We're also going to go through how blood flow restriction can be used with patients um, with patellofemoral pain syndrome, okay, which is a, uh, it's knee pain, okay, but a specific type of knee pain. So, Jordan, okay, so despite despite it looking like it's Jordan, it is Jordan, okay, so I know Jordan um, when I uh, moved over to Warwick, uh, Jordan was one of the development coaches, one of the interns there. And we couldn't have two Jordans on the staff. And I kind of won won that. Um, so I was Jordan. He got, you know, demoted to, to Jordan. So I stole his name. Um, but it's sick to see that he's gone on. Um, well, one, is a, is, a, is a great bloke. I never doubted it, but really smart person as well. Um, and I'm not surprised that he went on to do what he's doing. And he's doing a PhD um, at St. Mary's in that specific area. So blood flow restriction, um, and patellofemoral pain syndrome. So there's a lot of good chat around the the usability of that training tool. You know, uh, some considerations if you are thinking about using it. If you're um, somebody that would be a good candidate for that. Okay. So I'm going to get straight into the episode here. I'm not going to I'm not going to waffle on too much because I think there's a lot of really good stuff that you're going to take away from this. So if you have got any questions about blood flow restriction training, okay, head over to, to him on some of his social media accounts. I'm sure he'd love to have a chat with you about it. Um, and then same again for me, you know, if you want a little bit of my take on, on this particular training method, I can't give you much in terms of patellofemoral pain syndrome. Um, that is definitely a question for him and, and probably for a medical professional if you think you are somebody that is kind of struggling with that. But give us some feedback, okay? If you like it, share it. Tell somebody to come and listen to it. We want more people here, okay? We want more people, more listeners, more watchers. Um, that's, a, that's a fair point, more watchers as well. So if you're watching this on YouTube, um, you'll notice there's been a little bit of an upgrade. Um, so I basically changed. So the original podcast um, platform I was using was, was Zoom, Okay. And, and Zoom's great. Zoom was Zoom was really good. I already had a Zoom account, so it didn't cost me any money um, or any extra money. But I've basically upgraded to what we call Riverside FM. Um, and Riverside FM is actually a podcasting platform. Okay, it's made. You know, their slogan is "Made for podcasters from podcasters." That type of thing. Um, it's really cool so far. So this will be the the first proper episode I've recorded. Um, on this, which was which was cool. So when I, when I was downloading the um, the doc the, the the file after I finished with Jordan, when it first came up, he, he had no sound, and I was like, oh no, you know that was an hour and a half, well an hour and ten minutes of like high quality information, um, which just wouldn't come out the same if we had to repeat it. So, but no, we, we was fine. I figured it out. I put my nerd my nerd glasses on, and I, I figured out the issue. Um, but yeah, anyway, so as always, let us know if you enjoy the, the episode. Hope you get something from it. I know I definitely learned a lot in this episode. So good stuff. Let's get into it. Hey, we're in. Yes, mate. How are we doing? We all right? Yeah, yeah. Good, mate. You? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Mate, I don't know if you can tell just behind my shoulders, but I've got a fresh new office chair. This is first time I've like busted it out of the packaging as well. And I'm like... I'm absolutely buzzing. Took me ages to put up, um, but you know what? It's worth it. It's comfy, and that's how I know that I'm old when I'm buzzing off like little bits of furniture like this. <laughs> so. I was about to say, you know, when you get, you know, you're getting old when that's the type of thing that you're really excited about. Ridiculous, ridiculous. What have you been up to today, mate? Uh, not much, mate. Just been working. Um, we did some on uh, taking over running the placements for St Mary's for our students. Um, so just had some chats with some coaches that are looking to take on some of our student on placements and whatnot this morning. Walk the dog. So nothing crazy. Love that. Your stu your your placement stuff, is that the so we had to do a second year placement and it was like six to eight weeks? Is that is that what it is? Yeah, so they don't 
so the, our placements go out to all our students mm. and they can be applied for by anyone. Um, but I think in third year, they've got a requirement to do um, 60 hours. And I think on the masters, so on the on-site masters, they've got a requirement to do 100 hours. Got you. Um, but obviously we know how important it is that you go out and get some experience alongside your degree. So we have loads of providers coming in and they're seeking students that want to get some experience but because obviously they need a handout in the club students need to get some experience that's happy days really but they go out to everyone is that um like the the providers this is me thinking of my own stuff now i'm seeing like i'm seeing cogs turning do you get people is it like football clubs rugby clubs private facilities do you just get anybody and everybody or is it like specific types of providers We've mate, we've had everyone so far. So um, like I've been doing the role for a couple of weeks now, and um, had a look at what we've had in the past. Um, so we've had some private providers that are near the university, so private gyms. Um, but at the moment we've got a couple of football clubs, so uh, Fulham are advertising with us, Charlton. Um, we've got some rugby, um, GB kayak. Oh, schools. fair. That was I was speaking to schools this morning. Um, so just a bit of everything, which is great because the students have a rough idea of where they want to go and what they want to do. Mm. So it, it allows them to be a bit more flexible in their approach. Instead of just applying for a placement, they need a placement and find something that's tailored to their interests, Yeah, which is great. That's cool. I um, just, yeah, literally what I'm kind of thinking through there, this is just like an adapt side and I'm, I'm, I'm getting all my thoughts out there. I'm always trying to be open with this stuff, like what's what's going on behind the scenes in terms of building a business. Um, but one of the guys who I follow on on Instagram, um, he basically has like a, a placement student, but from a media college. So he basically, you know, he isn't going for the S&C side, he's going for media, just so they can run the behind the scenes stuff. And I thought that's that's actually clever, you know, and I think he did, I think he did six months of like an internship of like working, underneath him in that sense and then he's turned it into a job for him you know and I think it's great for this lad because what he's probably 16 17 just finished like his first year of college now he's earning like all right money you know so yeah that's cool that's that's funny um you did your did you do a placement in your undergrad as well where'd you do that uh I did oh I did several uh mm. <laughs> so in my undergrad, I wouldn't say as a placement, but during my undergrad, I found, ran the boxing team for the university. So during the second or third year, I did everything on that from actually coaching the technical side of the sport, but mm. doing the conditioning and strength work. So that was sort of an unofficial one. My first official ones came uh, when I was doing my master's. So that was Northampton Saints, um, Bedford's Performance Centre the mm. HPC so that was doing like uh, biomet testing and some training of scholars and external athletes uh, and then went into some schools the Connolly Foundation so I went into schools that did health-based PE rather than the sort of standard national curriculum uh, and we just tailored that to whatever turned up on the week whatever advice they wanted whatever they wanted to learn so it was quite nice and rounded for my master's year got a yeah. lot of different exposures yeah yeah that's sick that's sick right cool we've done a, a roundabout so let's go back to the beginning real quick then give everyone a little bit of a an elevator pitch you know give them a little bit of a an idea of who you are what you've done what you're doing now so my background sporting wise as a kid was in football and boxing um or as every young lad does in the country play football from a really young age up until I was still playing a couple of years ago um started boxing to get fit and fell in love with it um decided to go to university because that's the side of things that I was really interested in I think my boxing coach was potentially a little ahead of the curve even though that he was quite old in the fact of well you don't run you don't run 10 miles in a boxing ring everything short sharp fast you need to be out doing sprints blah 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 wanted to know why that happened why I felt so much better for doing what I was doing so I went and did uh, sports science and coaching as an undergrad at Bedford followed up by my masters in SSC at Bedford doing the placements that I just spoke through so Saints, Connolly Foundation, Human Performance Centre um, 
then came to Warwick for two years, um, kind of two years, kind of got mm. off by COVID a little bit, um, and I had a baby while I was there, mm. so yeah. that uh, broke things up as well. But um, that was a really great experience. Um, I learned a hell of a lot in the two years that I was there. Um, we got to, so for anyone that doesn't know about the internship there, we pretty much got to lead our own for our own clubs, our own scholars through whatever we thought was right, being assisted by, in my second year, yourself and Nick. And then mm. in my first year, it was a guy called John and Nick, which was great because we got to make loads of mistakes <laughs> in a low risk environment. Yeah, um, that's the, you know what, going back to, to that, I think that there's kind of that, how I, I'm trying to think how to put it. Sometimes I feel like interns and people that are coming through, and I thought this a little bit, you, you kind of consider yourself as, as free labor, you know, a little bit of a slave sometimes. And I think sometimes people do use interns in that in that regard, you know, get them on warm-ups because I can't be asked to do warm-ups. Um, and, and that's wrong. You know, I think you can learn a hell of a lot doing that type of thing. But Warwick definitely felt different to me in that sense. You know, I'm sure if you was going to speak to the, you know, the big wigs and the pointy heads in Warwick, they'd be like, they'd see, they'd see us as just free labor. Um, but the, the whole vibe around the, the, the development side and actually trying to guide you through mistakes, it, it just felt so different. It felt like a really, and I suppose that's down to Nick, you know, um, kind of crafting that environment and, you know, making it okay for you to fail and, and pushing you to have conversations with different people. Yeah. Yeah, no, mate, it was fantastic. I'd highly encourage anyone to go and do it. I th like, I, like I said, I learned a hell of a lot there. And um, I think the nice thing as well is you've got, uh, at the time, there's five, maybe six other interns making all the same mistakes, doing going through all the same processes that you're going through. Mm -hmm. um, because I know, like interning at big clubs, can be a lonely place. Like you feel like you can't ask a question for fear of failure or fear of looking a certain way. Mm -hmm. Where when you've got that number of other interns running their own clubs, working with their own scholars, you build, get them organic conversations that are so important to your development. So I thought it was great. Absolutely. It's, you know, there's the, the good thing as well is you get such a variety of people coming through, you know, and everyone's got the different strengths, different weaknesses, different interests. And, and there's never going to be a right or a wrong answer with, with S and C and sports science and those types of things. It's just, you know, the appropriate tool at the appropriate, you know, time in the environment, that type of thing. But I really like the variety, um, you know, and I think I kind of missed, um, missed erica because she was like the year before me but from what i hear she was kind of really bubbly really loud that type of thing you know and I heard she was really good at like the warm-up game side of things and could get people riled up and all that you know and then you've got the different style you've got people that are a little bit quieter a little bit more thought out every word is deliberate less of a personality but and i, I love that side of like looking at a team and how it's been crafted i just think it's it's interesting to see how those pieces like fit together Hundred percent. Like I, I went in as the, the science geek, probably. Mm. If, you, if you typify a young SNC coach, I think you've got the really, really good coaches, and then you've probably got the the science geeks that really like the intricacies of what's going on and program design and whatnot. And if we just take Erica as an example, she was probably the complete flip opposite of what I was. So we probably clashed a bit, mm. but like. From my development, I learned a lot by watching her and watching the way that she interacted and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, I think it's great to have such a mix of background, personalities, experience. It's, For sure. I think Erica was quite a bit older than us as well. So yeah. she had that life experience as well, which yeah. was really obvious to see. So That's cool. And what are you doing now then? So where you at at the present day? Yeah, so present day, I am at St. Mary's. So my main... The main chunk of my time is I'm at St. Mary's Uni. Um, so I'm a grad teaching assistant, which means that half of my time is spent teaching on the undergraduate degree. Um, so I do a few lectures and then most, the large bulk of my workload is in delivering all the practical side of the first and second year. Because especially first year is they spend a lot of time in the gym, which mm -hmm. is awesome because I think it gets everyone on, a level playing field but they also get that feeling of 
okay, this is what it's like to train properly and hard. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my more the side that I deliver. Um, the other half of what I'm doing at St Mary's is I'm now coming up to two years, probably a little bit longer anyway, because I started before it started, but um, two years into a part-time PhD. Cool. Which I'm looking at the effects of blood flow restriction on people with telephemoral pain syndrome um, and it's how it could potentially change biomechanic strength muscle mass and like pain um, yeah which has been really interesting but as a snc someone with an snc background has been really really challenging because mm. it's been really multidisciplinary in things that i have never spent much time doing or don't didn't know that well to begin with mm -hmm. so there's a large part of it that's based around biomechanics of human movement because we're using uh 3d analysis integrated with force plates um so there's that and a coding element within that um there's sort of the more clinical side of working with people in pain um then there's pain science mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah, so, it's been a really steep learning curve. Mate, and it, it gets you better, though. It gets you better quick. You know, if you survive it, you know, you've just gone through a huge um, growth, you know, in, in learning and knowledge, I guess. How long are you expecting the PhD to take you? So you're two years in, what are you thinking? How oh, long's a piece of string? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Max, I think, is seven years if you take a year's extension right up at the end. Um I don't want it to take that long. Um, so for a reference point, within the two years part-time, I'm just about to start the second study. Okay. Um, and we're probably 65, 70% of the way through the first one. Um, there's some problems with recruitment. Recruitment's just tough generally yeah. for pain patients, mm -hmm. unless you're linked up with a hospital. Yeah. Um, or you have your own physio practice, but even then it can be tough. Um, so, so the yeah, it's three studies, right? Three studies in a PhD, then a write up. Three to four. Okay. Um, some people more think it kind of depends on on the route you take. So, like a cliche I heard early on that made me cringe was uh, every PhD is different, and you're sat there like, no, it's not. Yeah. You're sat there as three naive student that doesn't know the process. Mm. Ah, come nah, on, be right. give on Yeah. Oh God, they're all so different. Like if you start off, so I think a, like a, a normal route into a PhD would be to start off with some sort of meta-analysis and systematic review, just so you get a feel of where you, where you are within the literature. It's a nice way to learn, but also at the same time to put something out there. Mm. And then studies off the back of that. I think if you're going to do a couple of, or a training study or a couple of training studies, longitudinal ones, they probably hold a little bit more weight because you're taking 12 weeks and working with 25 people, let's say. That's mm -hmm. going to take a year and a half to complete, potentially. Yeah. Um, so it really just depends on what, on what you're putting out there. Sick. Cool. I want to dig into that, mate. So I guess does it make sense to you if we kind of go through what is patellofemoral pain syndrome and then kind of talk about how blood flow kind of feeds into that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's so, a logical way to go. Yeah, so what is it? What is patellofemoral pain syndrome? So all it is is a pain at the front of the knee. Um, it's characterized by um, over like a three out of ten perceived rating of pain and getting pain in tasks such as like squatting, stairs, kneeling down, anything with a higher level of knee flexion. Mm -hmm. um, usually comes around because of, well, to my train of thought is it usually comes around because of two sort of very different scenarios. It's usually with people that are training, so like athletes, it's usually going to be a workload management problem most of the time. So we see it a lot in, in runners, in longer distance runners, where they're just ramping up the volume of work they're doing probably a little bit too quick and don't have the capacity to cope with it. Mm -hmm. um, or 
from the gem pop that I've seen so far, it kind of seems to be just a general lack of capacity and good quality movement. So they're, they're generally pretty weak because they, they don't train, they don't do much, and then um, they don't move that well because, again, they've never been coached through trying to train. And then <laughs> they'll go into a new job. So, example, like a nurse where they've gone from an office job to being a nurse and doing 15 to 20,000 steps a, a day. Yeah. And then their knees are going, ouch, what have you done to me? Why are you making me walk so much? <laughs> um, so that's the probably two subcategories, but that's not really within research. Like, Okay. Um, so with, with that then, what, what, um, so I'm just thinking about, so I've had knee pain in the past and, you know, the back in the day, everyone was like, oh, you've got jumper's knee, you've got patella, uh, you've got, yeah, patella tendonitis or tendinopathy, whatever. And I was like, well, I, I, I hear you with that, but my pain isn't, it's not below the kneecap. Okay. It's, mm. it's actually above the kneecap, you know, and then you start looking at, okay, what, what else kind of feeds into that? Is it a quadricep tendonitis and, or tendinopathy? And the other things that people say is, okay, maybe you've got patellofemoral pain syndrome. And I haven't looked into it in a little while, so I'm not, I'm not well versed in it or anything, but what is, you know, if you look at like patella tendinopathy, like, okay, there is an issue with the patella, uh, patella tendon. So what is it with patellofemoral pain syndrome? Where is the direct point? Is it a kneecap issue? Is it where everything's inserting or is, is that the question? So the problem with using the terminology of like patellofemoral pain syndrome or like runner's knee or anterior knee pain is that they're probably all a bit of a wastebasket term. Okay. Like it, it kind of catches everything that we can't or that people can't diagnose without scans or without um, anything obvious going on. So like, I think you could, you could quite comfortably uh, rule out like tendon problems. It, oh, sorry. My phone's just playing silly buggers. Okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to update. Cheers. Mm. Um, but yeah, you could probably quite comfortably rule out tendon problems within certain movements. So like jumping and landing and uh, as opposed to squatting. So it probably comes with sort of the higher magnitude type movements as opposed to potentially just squatting, kneeling down, walking yeah. up and down stairs. It may be more painful coming down the stairs than it may be going up the stairs with tendon. But um, mm -hmm. I think the, the pain people experience with patellofemoral pain syndrome is a bit more diffuse in nature. There's, there's not one real area it can come on anywhere around the sort of kneecap area. Okay. Um, it can come laterally, it can come behind, and it can be like a deepish sort of pain. Mm -hmm. um, people present quite differently. So I think we look at the them sort of criteria. We look at the type of sport or activities that people may be doing in their daily lives. Um, and then we rule out red flags for other pathologies um, and go from there. And then if you've done all that, you kind of, so it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So if you, got, yeah. you exclude everything else, you're probably left with this wastebasket term of you've got patellofemoral pain syndrome. I hear you. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So, so with that then, um, the blood flow restriction side, let's have a little bit of a chat around that. What is blood flow restriction? What is it? What is it not? You know, what, what does the current literature say it's good and bad for? So I'm just going to say BFR because blood flow restriction training is a mouthful. Mm. <laughs> um, BFR is for anyone that hasn't seen it. We, we apply like um, a cuff high up on the limb and we look into restrict blood flow to, to the limb. We then train in several different ways. It can be done passively also. Um, and from that, we're getting, we're seeing increases in strength and size that are comparable to high load, to sort of more traditional training. Mm -hmm. Say comparable because um, strength increases probably aren't quite as good as what you'll get with, with traditional training. Um, increases in size are more comparable. They're pretty much the same, if not potentially a little bit better with BFR, but 
again, I would say jury's out on that one because for most people, it's a really novel stimulus. And we know yeah. when you apply novel stimulus, the stress response is a bit higher. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's that. Um, and we typically go to like um, higher levels of what's called limb occlusion pressure on the lower limb than we do on the upper limb. So we look to occlude the lower limb to between 60 and 80 percent of the total limb occlusion pressure in the lower limb and probably more like 40 to 60 in the upper limb. Mm -hmm. um, and then if, if I just use training as an example, because it's the easy one, um, the set and rep schemes are pretty high compared to normal training. So the first there's, it's generally made up of four sets and it looks like um, a really high volume first set of 30 reps followed by three sets of 15. Um, and for anyone that's done it with a cuff, I know you have, mm. it's pretty tasty. Um, it can be a bit brutal. It burns. Um, it does. It does. Yeah. I remember the first time squatting with it. Um, mm. And I was warned. Yeah. <laughs> it, take my warning. It's, it's a mad feeling, mate. Like, <clears throat> I can remember reading about um, blood flow restriction and, you know, they called it occlusion training at the time. And the, was it the first study, Katsu, Kat, like the Japanese Katsu, thing? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So I can remember reading about this when I got my first ever um, gym instructor job, which was at the Grimsby Institute gym. Uh, it was like a student-led gym. And my kind of main resource for, for learning was like T Nation and that type of thing. And we'd go through, like, I went through the, the article and it was on hypertrophy at the time. And they were speaking through the different mechanisms at the time that were, you know, science backed. So there was mechanical tension, getting stronger. There was uh, waste product, uh, muscle damage. And then the other side of um, like the waste product buildup. And then they kind of led on to katsu training. Um, so we tried it and we didn't have, you know, all the fancy equipment and all that stuff. So we bought some knee wraps from my protein, some elasticated knee wraps. And, you know, I think what they said at the time is you just want to do it to a tightness of seven out of 10 or something like that. And it's so hard to find that seven out of 10. You're either at a 12 out of 10 or you're at a three. Um, yeah. So your, your arms either fell off or you, you've done nothing. It was really kind of difficult and, and hard to, to work with. But you know what? Like the, the instant results that I felt, you know, one, I felt like I had a pump for two days. Like I genuinely just felt like I had swelling, you know, my arms were this big. It was, it was insane. Um, so with, with blood flow restriction training them, um, so you said you can use lower loads. It's like 20%, right? Uh, yeah. So between 20 and some have gone all the way up to 40, although I think 40 is really tough. Yeah. Okay. So 20 to 40% of your one rep max, and you can still get the same hypertrophy stimulus um, than if you did normal and some of the, the yeah. common arguments, if you, you go, you go on Instagram, you go on Twitter, you go on those things. And I think it's starting to change a little bit, but the, the comments I was seeing more so was don't bother if you're, um, not injured, you know, that was the vibe they were given. If you can lift high loads, why would you not chase the strength gains as well as the hypertrophy gains? What's your kind of thoughts with that in terms of the context of it? Uh, I think it's a tough one. I think it's definitely has more of a place in the injured population. And I'll go on to talk a bit about like the pain research later and how we might use it a little bit differently to what's being used currently. Um, but I think it, it really just sort of depends. Like I've, I've, I've seen talk recently of, uh, from some bodybuilders and bodybuilding coaches that cycle it on and off because the the increases or like the metabolic metabolic overload is is insane compared to what you're doing um or what you can achieve just with with normal load in my opinion i've never felt anything like it without putting a cuff on mm -hmm. um the strength gains are still pretty potent they're just not as potent as using normal high load resistance training um so one of the pathways is an increase in uptake of fast switch motor, motor units mm -hmm. from it because um, there's not enough oxygen present to metabolize for the slow switch. Um, yep. So hence the first set being the 30 reps. So we're trying to get rid of the slow switch. 
yeah, and then the, the third, second, third, and fourth are probably the stimulating sets and reps. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it, it has in time and a place in people that aren't injured. Would I use it as a main source of training? No, probably not. Mm. Um, not for prolonged periods of time, but I think going back to what I said earlier, with for most people, it probably being a novel stimulus and you getting that cell swelling. Yeah. Um, that it, if you're bodybuilding and you are just trying to get big and you're not really too bothered if strength isn't optimally enhanced, then mm-hmm. go for it. Yeah. Like it, it is going to have big hypertrophy, a big hypertrophy stimulus for you. Um, you still will get a little bit stronger, or you still will get stronger just generally. So I don't, I don't think there's a downside. To I think it short that, term. yeah, that that aligns quite a lot with, you know, and I think we're we're probably of similar mindsets with a lot of things. People that can kind of look at a training method, look at the good, look at the bad, but look at the context in which it can be applied. Nobody's making you do just high load resistance training or just BFR. You can do both. You can go into the gym, five sets of five bench and pull-ups, do a little bit of mid-range work, and then boom, slap them off for a finisher at the end, you know? And then you've ticked yeah, all boxes. Um, mm-hmm. and, and that's what I do, you know? So I use it in my training in that exact way because I want both. I want to be a little bit stronger, a little bit more powerful, a little bit stronger, a little bit bigger. I want all those things. Um, so I guess the next like step to this then is how do we merge those two things together? We've spoke about what's, what's the acronym for patellofemoral pain shrim- syndrome? Uh, P- just say, you know, I'll, we'll just stick with PFP. PFP. Okay. So PFP and BFR, where are they merging? What's kind of the research saying? What's, what's it not saying? So the research into using BFR on people with PFP is limited. It's young. Um, I think at the top of my head, this or, or maybe even five, there's a fifth paper come out recently on its exclusive use in people with telephemoral pain. So I think the nicest thing from it, if we're, detract, if we're detracting from the, you're going to get bigger, you're going to get stronger without using as much load, which obviously the people in pain are load compromised anyway. Yeah. So um, that's obviously nice. But if we take away from that, um, where I see it being effective is in the short term, it reduces your perceived level of pain and allows, so there's some studies out there showing that it allows for therapeutic loading. So which would be the more kind of traditional rehab stuff Mm. um, and pain stays lower than what it would without EFR. So it's almost used as, can be used potentially as a bit of an extended warm up to then train the things that are a little bit harder to train with BFR, so like uh, the lateral hip muscles, let's say, because so, they're obviously proximal to the calf. So with that's that's interesting. That so, just to for some people might be a little bit more aware of like some of the acute pain relief effects or analgesic effects you can get from doing isometrics if you have tendon pain. So at the end of a warm up, you do some wall sits or you do some split squat isometrics or whatever. And it's supposed to give a really good analgesic effect for people with jumper's knee or, you know, patella tendonitis. Is that essentially what you're saying this is, but for PFP? Yeah. Um, okay. We've seen it in, there's a little bit of it in tendon research as well now okay. um, on that topic. So there's a, there's a study by Sentner in 2019 who found that the cross-sectional area of the Achilles actually increased with BFR, which blows my mind because it doesn't make any sense um when you're thinking that everyone looks to really heavily low the tendon mm. um, for increases in cross sexual area but yeah they've got increases in cross sexual area but also increases in size of the gastroc and in increases in strength which I'm were sure. similar to that of high load which is really cool and really interesting that is interesting i've um, never i've never thought of well i've thought about like tendon hype is that the is that the phrase you know when it's not muscular hypertrophy tendon hypertrophy is that the same but anyway let's, let's say size gains in the tendon you know and i suppose the the tendon is very i guess what you'd call avascular doesn't have much of a great blood supply kind of like a, a ligament so i guess that you know it's forcing that upon it or is it the fact that you're tiring out the the gastroc and the soleus so that the tendon has to do a little bit more work therefore experiences higher loading i don't 
I don't know. I'm just kind of well, thinking. I would out say hard. it's a combination of combination of both, mate. Yeah, yeah. I think you're you're stressing the pathway or the way that it works yeah. to a greater extent because you're reducing the oxygen content of of the surrounding area. Yeah. So there's probably a bit of that, but then it's also probably having to likely do a little bit more work because you're then stressing the musculature that's trying to isometrically contract when the tendons work in so you're stressing it there's probably a bit more shift because it's getting tired therefore tendons probably having to do a little bit more work but that's there's literally one paper on it and i'm it's what it's something i'm going to keep an eye on because i think it's really interesting but we back to patellofemoral very similar very similar sort of idea that it should reduce pain and it's been shown to reduce pain scores in healthy people as well um, mm -hmm. so ob objective pain so we use something called a pressure pain threshold is usually what we'll see within the pain literature which is an algometer that so it's got like a it looks like a finger basically with a a unit on the top of it you press it into the area it reads out kilograms of force um, it's one centimetre in width, so you're applying a pressure until that the person's telling you, okay, I'm starting to feel a little bit of pain now, and you stop. Okay. So we're seeing that BFR uh, increases that, so they can tolerate a little bit more pressure, which, like from the pain science, we know is probably no susceptive in nature, so it's inhibiting mm. some of the pathways that tell your brain that, okay, this is sore. Mm. Um, and we've seen that in patellofemoral pain as well. So, yeah, I think it's quite, it's exciting because you could use it, for me, you could use the BFR in a couple of ways. You could use it as the main training stimulus. Um, so you're in the gym, you're doing your leg press, doing your extensions, curls, whatever. Probably more machine-based with BFR because it's, I, I think it's really tough to mm. hit the higher pressures needed in the lower limb. Um, without being assisted through the movement. Yeah. Um, so we could do it that way, where we know that, say, for patellofemoral pain, that training the hip and the quad simultaneously is quite an effective treatment method for short-term and to medium-term outcomes. So reducing pain and getting them back, running, change direction, that type of task. Mm. But there's also the fact that you could potentially use it in a warm up, yeah. um, modified to then go out and so it's really common in runners to then go out and hit some, do some running. How would you, um, I guess, using it in like an extended warm up then, you know, if you're using it as a way of kind of creating a little bit of a pain relief effect for the rehab session ahead, would you change mm -hmm. the 30, 15, 15, 15 protocol? Would you, would you reduce the, the pressure or would you keep it the same? What's your thoughts? I think I would re I would be looking to reduce the pressure. So we've seen that there's a hypoalgesic effect at a minimum of forty percent of LOP. Okay. So if I was looking to use it as like um yeah just as a pain pain relief type thing, I would yeah bring it right down to forty, maybe fifty, sixty, dependent on the person and how they respond to that stimulus, um and go from there and then load because the, we do see a reduction in see pain from 40 um yeah. which has been shown quite quite a lot now so i suppose I that's that. it's kind of like a balance there isn't it you've got the the fact that you want to get the pain relief effect um from the the bfr but you almost don't want to fatigue the musculature around the area too much to the point where it causes faulty mechanics or doesn't allow you to get the actual progressive overload of the the session ahead i suppose in my mind i'm just trying to weigh up those two things a little bit Hundred percent. Like I think something that I've had to do recently is um, so just to talk through like my current study, just for context. So the first study we we're looking at in depth biomechanics of the way that people with telofemoral pain move compared to those without. Mm. So we're looking at like um, joint and muscle loads, and then the second one is is looking at the effect of different interventions on their perceived pain and if we see a change in biomechanics, because mm. we know that faulty biomechanics can lead into you contracting patellofemoral pain. Okay. Um, so I'm 
have been piloting different pressures because we'll do the mechanics, then we'll go into the gym and do whichever sort of therapeutic loading we're doing. So it'll be like high load, low LOP BFR. The thought before was to do a high LOP BFR, so on and so forth. Um, but I was doing the high load on the leg press and then I was getting up and I was like, right, okay, one of my functional movements now is I've got to jump. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's not happening. Um, yeah. Not with the way that my quad and my hip is feeling. It's, yeah. I'm barely going to leave the floor. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think the individual responses to BFR are quite different personal person anyway. Yeah. So it's one of them things that you'll have to tinker with, but just as a pain relief thing, I would start at 40% of LOP because we know that that will have a drastic reduction in, or a reasonable reduction in, in perceived pain. Mm. And then go about your session as normal, see what happens, see how long it lasts for, tailor it from there. I would, it's almost like that minimum effective dose type. Yeah. I, would work, I would work up until I find it. Got you. Um, yeah, start low, gradually add, and then once you've hit it, you've hit it. Cool. Yeah, that's it. So with with that, um, this kind of segueing off in a slightly different direction, um, one of the things I was thinking about, you know, when I was kind of thinking around this chat is when I've done um, blood flow restriction, I've done the exact same thing of using it in warm-ups because I'd – I'd heard people kind of speaking around the the pain effect, but also a way of getting the musculature a little bit warmer, getting more blood flow into the area, getting more blood flow into the tendons just to basically speed up that warm-up process. And one of the things I noticed was, in my mind, a little bit of a – I have really tight quads just in general – but I noticed like a, an improvement in my quad flexibility or at least my perception of that quad flexibility, which is maybe just the, you know, the, the pain analgesic effect anyway. It just I can push past, you know, tension a little bit better. But what, um, what it kind of got me thinking about was the idea of, of voodoo flossing, you know, of wrapping something super tight around a joint or a muscle really tight. Have you seen voodoo flossing before? Have you seen Kelly Starrett doing it? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Not loads, but I understand what he's talking about, yeah. Yeah, so he's, I mean, basically, for the people that aren't aware, you basically, you get like a, what does he use? He has his own brand, but it's like a bicycle tube, you know, so really kind of tough rubber. Um, You wrap it around uh, your elbow. Let's say you've got golfer's elbow. You wrap it around your elbow, um, and then you basically get somebody to crank your arm, you know, and move it because you can't do it because you've done it that tight. And the thought process around that is, one, when you take the um, the thing off, you're going to get a big flushing of, of blood and nutrients to that elbow, which is going to help for tendons that generally don't have a great blood supply. But the other side of it is because you're wrapping something up pretty tight, so you might have like, I don't know, three inches above the elbow, three inches below the elbow, where there's obviously muscles and tendons. Because you're cranking your arm in such a way, you're going to get flexibility benefits in those muscles either side of that joint. So you're basically pinning it down and then making it move. And and that's kind of how it felt to me. I don't know if there's much science or any science behind voodoo flossing, actually. But I, all I can say is it, it worked, you know, and actually gave me some really instant relief. But that was the kind of vibe I got. I It felt like voodoo floss, in my mind, is like BFR on steroids, you know, mm-hmm. and probably just really kind of, I don't know, off the cuff. Does anything like that, does that make sense? Is there anything there where you're thinking actually like science supports that or science doesn't support that? Because it felt just so similar. Yeah, I can't say in terms of like the range of motion because it's not something that I've read or mm. seen. Um, but it, it, not with the movement of the limb, but if you look into sort of the IPC research, so ischemic preconditioning, um, we've sort of seen some of that pain relief effect from that as well and what that is is a total occlusion of the limb yeah. so it's at 105 percent, and then they'll lay there and that's it it's passive um, how long on and then uh five minutes five minutes with 105 percent. so essentially you're cutting yeah. off full full blood supply to, to that area um three to five minutes yeah and then um yeah it's not an area that i'm completely because it's not really what i'm looking at so i can't really go too far in depth on it that sounds but, gross, um, mate. Yeah, so it's, it's it sounds awful. 
it's a few minutes of complete um yeah complete um restriction and okay. then followed by a period of reperfusion so complete obviously um let it flush in yeah so it sounds really quite similar to that it's not something i've done it sounds gross it's something i'm about to do for somebody else's study and i'm not looking forward to it um, no, so but yeah um so it sounds quite similar to that and there is some evidence to support it i think if we're if we're going on like what we can do with um bfr as well in terms of like a warm-up is there's absolutely no reason you can't just jump on a bike okay um, so, so this is some sort of go on carry on mate go on so this is this is going to be one of my questions going forward around the bfr uh, bfr side of you know just like uh cyclical movements you know running biking cross trainer whatever like what's the research around that type of thing it's good um so i think what was quite uh interesting is a recent paper that's come out and they've had people uh administer a bfr and then they'll do like a walk, walking based intervention and they'll um increase their vo2 max and that's in trained people okay and uh, so there's obviously some sort of peripheral sort yeah. of adaptation to the limb so it's a better probably more efficient um delivery of of oxygen to the to the limb which is then for increasing their vo2 oh. um, which that's really that's new i read that last week i think so that's really interesting um i've done a study on a bike um which was looking at the effects of pain um in cycling um at different occlusion pressures and yet again like the 14 80 percent both yielded decreases in pain and you'll have different periods of uh it's just a bit like a hit sort of session you do mm. a couple of minutes on let the let reperfusion happen so let the blood flow back in and then uh restrict it again so put the cuff back on for a couple of minutes and up to like five cycles um mm. so yeah that, that brings pain down but it also muscle mass and strength go up as well as vo2 so that's a really nice way if, if people are injured so like injured athletes or even just semi-load compromised athletes mm. just jump on a bike it's it's nice it's short it's sharp and we're seeing potentially quite nice benefits from it um anecdotally i know that um pretty sure it was wolves came to one of my supervisors for some advice around it and like they've adopted it really nicely within their sort of uh, return to play and injuries and injury mm. management now um, okay and they they do a lot of aerobic base stuff on bikes with it that's um, that's it's... Just so interesting that mate like in i i always try and think of things like a little bit simpler i'm a bit thick and a bit ditzy like so the the idea of like wrapping up your limb you know so you know putting it um just below your hip so you've got got it on your legs you get on a bike you or a, a walking or whatever so you're not actually making necessarily changes to the respiratory system in in a sense you know there's no lung changes but obviously because the lung and all the oxygen content goes to your legs we're just improving the way your legs use the oxygen you've got that's essentially what you're saying yeah, yeah so it's just it's the economy of the muscle essentially mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah, the cool delivery and sort of um improving because you're just stressing the the the, the uh, arterial system so much that it's going to have to adapt. Yeah, so it's your, your uh, buffering and all that type of thing, I'm guessing. Yeah, it's... probably increases of like surface levels of veins, arteries, that type of thing as well. Yeah. Um, so if you're thinking back to like um, Martin Bouchard's like book on central and um, peripheral adaptations we're probably looking more towards the peripheral side of of the adaptations that are occurring with with bfr in uh endurance exercise well endurance in sort of uh, yeah. aerobic exercise sick no that's cool and i guess another question i've got i'm i'm bloody, i'm firing them off mate because i'm going so the recovery side of you know the passive side of using bfr What's the research around that? Is is there any research or is this kind of really anecdotal at the moment? I think it's new. It's very new. It's mm. not something I know too much about and it's not something that I've gone out of my way to read on because it's not something I've had to had to administer or um 
anything. Yeah, so I think it has merit because of the things that we sort of spoken around in terms of like uh, the reperfusion element of, of what's going on. Um, and anecdotally, it seems like athletes are getting on great with it. Um, but sort of past that, I, I don't, I can't pass too much comment because it's not something that I've gone out of my way to read enough around. Mm. I think it, in my in my mind, it makes it does make a lot of sense, you know. And I think if it is passive in nature, you don't have to do anything other than just slap on some cuffs and just sit and watch TV. Or if you're on a coach home, it does just make sense to me. Um, mm -hmm. One of my friends, he's the S and C coach for the ice hockey team in Berlin, so Berlin Ice Tigers. Yeah, that's right. Um, and he uses it with them. You know, they're, they've all kind of bought their own units. So they've got an entire team that have just bought their own. It was, I think they might have bought the Saga ones, to be fair. Um, so like, I don't know, probably 300 quid for an upper and a lower body kit um, set. And that's what they do because they do a lot of traveling around Europe and all that type of thing. And it just gets them on the bus, boom, slap it on every, I think he might do a five minutes on, two minutes off times three, you know, so 15 total minutes of, of being um, restricted. And it's one of the things, you know, I'd love to kind of, I need to do some digging, to be honest with you. I think that's one of the things I need to do. I need to trial it myself, but I'm thinking more for some of my uh, mountain bike athletes. Because um, the way the mountain biking at weekends work is they go on a Tuesday, they travel on a Tuesday, they get there on a, a Wednesday, they'll have practice, they'll have practice on a Thursday, they'll have qualifiers on a Friday, and then they'll have like a race weekend, essentially. So there's a lot of time, one on the bike, or a lot of time doing like track walk, and just generally the track walks, mate, are so steep, you know, top to bottom of, you know, the steepest mountain in Ben Nevis, it's, it's stupid. And I'm just thinking, is that something I could use or do I need to? Yeah, it's just something that I think I'm going to look into because I think that could be that could be just a really easy win. They do a lot of massage stuff. That's something that's kind of baked into the sport is they do get a rub down after every day. Um, so maybe this but, is just and something. If you think about like the the processes that a massage is, is going to take through, it's just going to promote increased blood flow. Yeah. Right. Which yeah. is all that passive BFR is going to do in them in them parts of, of reperfusion. So I would mm -hmm. say like the mechanisms behind that are, are probably very similar. Yeah. In the terms of, of of how they're adapting. So like if you if you haven't got the, the money or the facilities or someone to come and do the nice massage and increase some of the blood flow to the area, they, I can't see a reason why using it passively as a recovery method would would be a bad thing. Yeah, um, we know from like the literature, even training with it is really recoverable. You can you can train with it five six times a week mm. and not feel too bad. Um, so, like, the, I, I can't talking from like a common sense call side of things because I don't really think there's much research into it yet. Um, I would say that it, it's there's not a downside to it. Yeah, yeah. It's, other than other than spending money, so that potentially wasting your time, but it's not like you're just going to be sat there doing nothing, just staring at a wall. You, you're probably going to be watching TV or on a bus when it's dead time anyway. Um, but I, I mean, in the, in the money aspect of things anyway, there's, there's absolutely no reason you couldn't go for a practical BFR approach, which is using the knee sleeves, using something elasticated to, to administer it yourself, mm. find, see the effects of that. And then, if it works, if you feel good from it, great. Go out and invest and actually put some money into your recovery, which I would recommend investing into like air bands or something like that because you know what you're administering to yourself in terms of the percentages. So there's, there's a couple of studies out there that show that you can't really even teach people what a 7 out of 10 or a 6 out of 10 is on their <laughs> LOP. Mate, I can, so, like, <laughs> I can remember when we first started doing it, um, oh God, this is bad. We, we first started doing it. We was in pure gym. Uh, I had my knee sleeves, uh, knee wraps, sorry, the elasticated ones. And one of the lads who is, is one of the boys who we used to train with occasionally. He was like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I'm doing BFR. Um, he's like, oh, cool. And this is before, you know, I, I wasn't even a personal trainer really at this point. So I probably have no liability. Um, 
But he's like, yeah, what do you do? I said, literally, mate, just wrap it up, you know, get it round there. You do your 30, 15, 15, 15, bang in, big arms, you know, you, you're sorted. And I'm, I'm, mate, he rang me like two days later, like, mate, I've got gangrene. I was like, do you, do you even know what gangrene is? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, he said, my arms are green. I was like, I, I don't know what you've done, but it's probably not great. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. It, so that it, is like one of the problems with it is, 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 if you're going to do that and you're going to do the sort of in if, if you want to research it it's, it's practical bfr um, is that you can really overshoot the mark um <laughs> so some of the studies i've seen so like full occlusion usually happens at around 200 millimeters of mercury um are some of the studies i've seen where people are trying to administer it this to themselves have gone up to three of course yeah and it's only a couple of people out of say 30 but that's still way too much to exercise with and train yeah. with. Um, so err on the side of caution if you're going to do it, definitely. Yeah. But it, it's one of the things that's worth it. And I think we've all been there. So like the beginning of lockdowns, I had not a lot to train with. We made a little farm gym. Mm. Didn't have that much load and had a go. Yeah. I think the first time I did it, way too tight. Second time I did it, nowhere near enough. And then yeah, Goldilocks, isn't find it? that... Yeah, you sign that. You find that sweet spot. Um, but if you're going to do it, definitely, I would invest. At least you know what's going on is safer. Yeah, because you know what's going on. And you know what occlusion pressure you're at. Um, How much yeah. are airbands? You know, airbands are similar to what you said earlier. I think for an upper lower set, they're about three twenty. Oh. We don't use uh, that. Just from some research that I've done, we use. Um, a company called Delphi. Okay. They're sort of the original. Um, they're really, really expensive. Um, yeah. They're brilliant. They're the gold standard. They're medical grade. Yeah. Um, research level standard. That's why we obviously use them. Um, I think, like, if it's all right with you, I think there's some like considerations with buying that, uh, like your go for it. If our costs. Just because there's so many different brands out there, and I've had a few questions before, and it's like, what ones do I buy? And I'm like, mate, these are the considerations. There's probably 30 different brands out there. So the size of size of the cuff, so in terms of like the width is important. The the less width, the higher the pressure to occlude the limb, mm -hmm. which then becomes uncomfortable. Like yeah. if you've got a really thin one and you've got it on your quad, it's gonna really I'm going to say it's going to hurt. It's not mm. nice. Um, yeah. So we want like a, a decent size width. And that's why there's upper and lower sets when you look at things. So that they're tailored to the, obviously the upper and lower parts of the body. Um, conical in shape. So like an ice cream cone. So it, it, it contours to the shape of the muscle and the shape of the limb. So that again brings down your... Yeah, your LOP a little bit, um, okay. which again, for comfort, is nice. Um, and then I think like the, what the airbands do and what other companies have done is is you want to find something that automates your, finds your LOP and automates that for you because you can still buy ones with the Doppler and try and do it that way. But just mm -hmm. if you can find an automated one that's within your price range, it's it's going to be simple. A quicker, quicker for you, a lot more simple. So. Um, I think they're the, the biggest ones. You, you're you starting to probably look at a little bit more money, but you want ones that relax and contract with the muscle if possible. Mm. So if you're thinking, because um, I know that Delphi ones do that and I haven't tried that many other brands, so it's hard for me to say, but you're thinking about the tension in the muscle whilst you're doing, to say, like a leg extension muscle and the diameter of the le of the upper leg is going to increase in size as you do it. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if your cuff can't adjust to that whilst you're forming the rep, your LOP is actually varying as yeah. you're doing it. So while so while the muscle's contracted, you're at, you're, you're at quite a lot more um, occlusion than what you are then in the rest of the state. That makes so perfect sense, mate. I've never, I've never thought about that. But yeah, it, it's common sense that. But not common. And when you're, yeah, and when you're applying it as well, then off off the back of that, it's 
is something that the literature doesn't state too much anymore, but they measure LOP in the position that you want to perform the exercise. So if you're on a bike, measure your LOP on the bike and go yeah. from there because it can change depending on whether you're sitting, standing, kneeling, lying. Um, so I would measure in the position that you're going to be or if you want to use it for multiple exercises, obviously that's full leg, so do it lying down. Yeah, got you. Okay. Mate, that's, that's, that's sick, that. That's it. I feel like from that just little bit of information at the end, that's just super valuable um, because no doubt there'll be, you know, a few questions of people thinking, actually, is it worth just playing around with? Um, mm. And I think, well, yeah, mine were about 300 quid. Um, I use the Saga Fitness ones. I haven't used airbands before. Um, I actually, um, I was using the leg ones the other day and I felt one of them pop. Um, and I was like, oh shit. And essentially what had happened, I think what had happened is the, the air pump, which is the little badge that you see, um, it detached from the valve around the actual cuff. So the, what do you call it? An air bladder or whatever, something like that. Yeah, yeah. So it detached. Um, I was like, fuck, um, proper gutted. But it, it's one of those, it's technology in the sense, you know, I said to the, sent them an email, I think it's pop. They sent me like a, a few things to try, to try and fix it. Um, just really easy pressing certain bits didn't work and they just sent me a new pair anyway so that was that was buzzing um oh but that's the i guess that's the other side of what i've kind of found like we've wrapped up you know your arms and your legs and and it takes a little while you sometimes need a partner to do it for your upper limb it just it gets really awkward i found some of the annoying bits about it being connected to your phone or technology in general is technology isn't perfect. It does sometimes make our life really simple, but because you get so used to how simple it is when it breaks, it's like, holy fuck. If mate, yeah. have you ever had like the Wi-Fi in your house turn off or your phone just doesn't work, it's like, you feel like you're in the wilderness. It's like, oh, I can't do anything. I can't survive now. It's so bad. It's awful. Mate, it's a, it's a weekly thing. So for the study, I use like the 3D analysis and, when it so we use Vicon when it runs perfect absolute dream on marker up on go move around happy days you're done yeah. when it doesn't work oh my god it's the, the hardest thing to troubleshoot and it just ruins your day like yeah. tech can just ruin your day <laughs> it honestly does like one of the things that's fucking me off at the minute is Instagram um for for such a probably multi-million trillion but whatever it is they've got they've got aliens of money and people working for them every time i upload a video at the minute it just turns the sound off and goes like hisses at me for some reason i've tried five times today and it's still hissing at me um but yeah technology can fuck off right then mate i want to wrap up um so yeah, thank you very sure. much for your time mate that was absolutely quality i know there's gonna be loads of takeaways um for people um but i think the other I side of it is if this has kind of piqued your interest a little bit, just do your own reading, you know, do your own reading, have a little look into some of the different uh, resources that are out there. Um, I don't know if you've got any kind of ones that you think would be appropriate for people to look at. I don't know if there's any off the top of your, top of your head. Yeah, so as, as is a nice starting place, I think, uh, so Stephen Patson, my supervisor, he's got paper out, I think it's 2019, 20, something like that fairly recent, which is like uh, methodology and considerations for applying blood flow, blood flow restriction. So I think that's a really nice start place because it gives you some ideas behind training with BFR um, in the gym, aerobically, and also a little bit of IPC stuff. So okay. if it will cover a nice broad range and it will also give you some rabbit holes to dive down because there'll be obviously references that you think, oh, that's interesting, and then read off. Yeah. Um, and then if you want to go in, into the practical BFR side because you want to try it and you don't want to buy a cup straight away, uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Lanetti's lab. So um, do most of that sort of stuff and their stuff's really good. So I'd have a look at their papers. I can't think of a title of one off the top of mm. my head because we've got so many. But What I'll do, mate, is uh, I'll put all that information in the show notes below so people can just click on, you know, click on it and I'll take you through um i'll do that i'll do the heavy lifting for them but yeah i just want to thank yeah. you mate um that was absolutely sick buzzing from that i know there's gonna be loads of takeaways um in terms of kind of finding out a little bit more around the stuff that you do is there any particular social media or anything like that that you kind of use 
Yeah, I mean, I'm on social media and you can follow me if you want to. I'm probably not too big on using it consistently. I think I'm going to put stuff out on Twitter when I publish and going to start to share things I think are interesting around telephone pain and BFR more regularly soon. So that would be just at Jordan, J-O-U-R-D-A-I-N, B mm -hmm. underscore for Twitter. Um, and that would be the main place of like sharing information from me and it's not too regular. But um, if you have questions and you want recommendations and stuff, just reach out. I'm really happy to have a chat. Sick. Nice one, mate. Appreciate your time. Thank you. No probs.